And so we have next up, we're going to learn how to fall faster with Mike Curtis Rose. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just a, qu a, a quick question is, who actually likes to jump out of planes um, at all? Anyone in this room likes to jump out of planes? Um, anyone else in the room who particularly likes falling? And I mean, that doesn't mean necessarily off buildings, but maybe falling when you're a bit drunk in the pub, falling off walls, falling out of bed. Anyone? Falling generally is considered bad. I mean, it's generally not good for the body. It's not generally good for your lifespan if it's over a certain height. And falling out of planes is pretty exciting as long as you've got a parachute. Um, however, sometimes people want you to fall and they want you to fall faster. Um, anyone know what terminal velocity is? Maximum speed of the human body um, straight down. Um, give me an answer um, at the front. Uh, closer to kilometers. Someone else. You little guy at the back. Yep, you. A mm, bit lower. Anyone else? Give me an answer. Over. 140, close. 140 is pretty close. About 122, 123. Irrespective of how big you are, how long, how tall, a little bit um, affected by effectively what you're wearing, but fundamentally you can't fall faster than about 120 miles an hour. However, 120 miles an hour going into anything, doesn't matter whether it's water, concrete, etc., is probably going to kill you. Um, if it doesn't kill you, it's certainly going to hurt. So sometimes you want to fall faster. And generally, most people who want to fall faster are either mad, uh, they've already been committed, or they're TV presenters. And in this case, this is TV presenters. So last year, I was approached by the BBC uh, to ask me, could I use uh, effectively my skills? And I should caveat that I'm a prop rocket propulsion engineer in my day job um, most of the time, and I focus on 3D printing in my other time. And they said, we have got a TV presenter. We want to see if we can make him fall as fast as a peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon dives at about 240 miles an hour. And this was for a CBBC series called Beyond Bionic. The presenter was a guy called, um, still is actually, he's not dead, fortunately, um, a guy called Andy Torbert. He's, he's ex-bomb disposal. He's a bit mad. He likes to climb mountains and jump out of planes. Perfect candidate. And they wanted him to jump out of a plane dive at the same speed as a peregrine falcon, exceed 240 miles an hour, and the crucial thing, be alive when he got to the bottom. Important from an insurance perspective. And the way they wanted to do this was they'd already um, effectively worked out what they wanted. They wanted a pair of big rocket engines to attach to him. Not probably because the rocket engines were the right things to use, but because the rocket engines look really cool and they'll be great on TV. Great. So they've basically asked me, can you get a pair of rocket engines, jet turbines, something like that, can you attach them to him? And I was like, yes, probably. Do you want him alive at the bottom? They said, oh, absolutely, he needs to survive. So that was good for Andy and his family and probably good for the insurance company. Um, but the challenges of trying to do that is really hard. So I, if you can probably tell I'm wearing, at the moment, these are our first iteration of what do you, how do you attach rocket engines to yourself? So um, I'm just going to come over here and stand up here because I, can't, I think that's probably easier. So if I do this, you can see, and assuming I don't fall off because it will be really spectacular, you can see I'm basically wearing metal boots, a little bit like medieval knights would wear. Um, excuse me, sir, if I just put my foot there. You can see they've got brackets coming out the side. And effectively what we were going to do were attach small gas turbines in the same sort that you use for radio-controlled aircraft to the sides. Now, the problem is, is it's not so much about having the gas turbine, which is pushing you down. And you don't need that much thrust. You need something in the region of between 10 to 15 kilos of thrust per side. That's fairly easy to do with a small gas turbine. The problem is, is what happens when it goes wrong? And wrong is one of f a few things. Wrong is catching on fire. Catching on fire is bad. Catching on fire with your engine on fire, then catching your parachute on fire, and then plummeting towards the ground from 12,000 feet is really bad. So you've got to do something about that. So the idea is, how do you get rid of the engine? So in some way, you effectively dump the engine. And the idea is effectively to have, be able to kick your leg up here, pull a pin, if you can pull the pin under centrifugal force, and the whole thing should go pa -ching. The reality is, as you just saw, I pulled the pin, and that was quite easy, because I'm standing like that on one leg, and I'm not spinning in circles, not with my parachute wrapped around me. In reality, the insurance company said, <laughs> It's a nice idea, but you want to attach a gas turbine to a guy jumping out of a plane and then make him do a complicated maneuver where he has to pull a pin and you're expecting it all to go to plan. And we said, yeah, it probably will do, but maybe not every time. That wasn't good enough for the insurance company. So that option basically didn't work. So we then went on to a different system, which 
was this wonderful bad boy. Now, this is kind of the, in essence, the inglorious way of making something. This is very heavy. I'm going to pass it around, um, starting in the front with you, sir. Um, this system is basically mounted on your thigh. It's a better place than your foot, because the problem with having something on your foot, when you kick your leg back like that, with an engine running really fast, you tend to basically melt your feet, and that's again bad. So this system was designed to basically attach to your leg in such a way that you could then pull one of the complicated pins which you can see attached to it, and the whole thing would push away. And again, the other caveat I have to throw in there is that you can't just ditch the engine. If you're ditching an engine which weighs maybe two to three kilos, plus fuel tank, plus ignition circuitry at 12,000 feet, unless you do something with that engine, the chances are it's going to hit the ground. The chances of it hitting someone is fairly slim. However, you can't take into account the fact it's not going to hit anyone. So you have to have a parachute incorporated as well which further complicates the design. And uh, you can probably tell as we're going down this line, the uh, guy jumping out the plane effectively has a really heavy thing now attached to his waist, and that's not really ideal. It's also a jet engine, so it gets hot, it has to be canted away from the body, which is bad, and it gets more and more complicated. And then we've got another effect of something called counter-rotation. And counter-rotation is effectively the wake coming out of the engine swirling um, and with turbines, they tend to spin in one direction. So the problem is you can end up with this counter-rotation of two engines with this swirl, this wake of hot air um, coming out from behind you, which effectively twists you. So not only are you now going straight down, in theory, you're also spinning in a circle. And again, if you're trying to deploy a parachute at the point the engine switches off, the probability of that working, your parachute not getting wrapped around you or wrapped around something else is very slim. So that's pretty bad. The biggest problem with the jet turbines, though, is basically the pilot said no, unsurprisingly. And so if, if I approached you and said, hey, Mr. Pilot, um, we want to start two jet turbines in an aircraft which is inherently flammable at 15,000 feet with a lot more flammable things on board and a bunch of TV presenters, and we just want to hang out so he's sitting literally over the, um, effectively, the platform of the aircraft where you'd exit, kind of literally like this, while I'm hanging down trying to turn these engines on because they don't start up instantaneously. Um, can you see anything going wrong with this? Pilot was like, mm-mm, it's not happening in my aircraft. You can go and do something else. So that kind of blew that up. And also, at the same time, the insurance company going, so you want to jump out the aircraft with a pair of jet engines attached to you. Is this to fly, to go faster? Uh, no, it's to fly fast going down. Sorry, can you say that again? Yes, going down. Uh, actually, can we just pass you to a colleague of ours? Okay, that, that lesson over. Don't talk to insurance companies about strapping engines to yourself, at least if you want to go up. Um, so we then basically, and this is where we got into 3D printing. So the thing in which you're passing around currently, really, really heavy. This, on the other hand, really, really light. So this is actually printed on an Ultimaker 2. Pretty small platform. Many of you probably have got a similar small 3D printer, fused deposition modeling, easy to utilize, etc. cetera. Um, it's printed in nylon. It's lightweight. It's really strong. However, it's not for a turbine. Turbines get hot. This is for an electric ducted fan. Um, show of hands quickly, anyone doesn't know what an electric ducted fan is? OK. Anyone know what a Dyson vacuum cleaner is? Everyone, hopefully. OK. Di electric ducted fan roughly is where Dyson works. High speed motor, inner shroud, forces air through at a very high pressure. Bit like a jet engine. However, the exit velocity of the air coming out isn't in effectively the um, hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers an hour. It's typically more in the hundreds. So um, it's effectively a lower thrust, what we call a static thrust. But it still gives you an, an, an effectively enough thrust to give you the lift that you need or the downward force that you want. So you can put something like that into um, an engine. Um, Lawrence, could you uh, come up here, please? Or actually, just walk to the front. That's probably a safer place for everybody. Uh, go that way. You want to stand on the speaker? Oh, um, yeah, you can stand on the speaker. Um, this might be interesting. So um, Lawrence um, has very kindly volunteered to demonstrate the system that we decided to use. Um, so um, while he does look a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, I can assure you he's not. Um, so what we fundamentally have is we have a pair of electroducted fans on either side. And these are held with 3D printed holders, which incorporate everything. Nice, elegant design, combine as much as you can. So effectively, on each side, you've got a pair of batteries. Um, just around here, if you can see, there's an, um, an electric speed controller comparing, um, controlling the power out of a pair of lithium-ion batteries. And then they run basically to the ducted fans. 
Ducted fans have about 13 kgs of static thrust each. Um, they're not technically off the shelf. I borrowed them from an ex-defense um, project. Um, but I don't think they'll know about that, so it's fine. Um, and this hasn't been any recorded or anything, so it's perfectly safe. Um, and then this basically is linked to this really complicated harness um, and this grab handle here. Lawrence, don't pull the grab handle. Uh, that definitely don't pull the grab handle. If he pulls the grab handle, what happens is these black cables, if you can see, and do come up afterwards and have a look, um, basically get pulled out and the straps basically release. So you can dump the entire engine. And the key thing is it actually built inside the cavity, inside the plastic, there's a effectively a parachute. Um, and that parachute would normally be tied very loosely with effectively parachute thread to his trouser legs. So if he needs to dump them, they get in the way, etc. pulls the handle, power, um, engines fall away, parachutes get ripped out, and as they get ripped out, that thread breaks, the parachutes deploy, and the engines drop. And that way, the worst that will happen is you'll get something the equivalent of, um, to a, a fairly large conker hitting you on the head. I mean, it's probably going to hurt a bit more than that, but it's not going to kill you. So um, these are powerful. And if you just give me one second, I'll connect them and demonstrate actually how powerful they are. Lawrence won't fly. If there's anyone lighter in the audience, you might fly. But my insurance doesn't cover that. So this is usually the bit when everything goes wrong because it has software involved. Um, and as we've seen so far, I think this week, software generally demonstrates that things don't work very well. That's going to be interesting. Right. Hold that. Don't let that get sucked into those, otherwise bad things will happen. So now Lawrence has a control box, and the way we did this actually in flight was with a pressel switch, which the pilot held in his mouth, the TV presenter, effectively. So when he bit down, effectively out of fear or happiness, um, the engine sped up. And w uh, the first time I learned this is that TV presenters cannot be trusted. You cannot tell them, don't pr put your fingers in the pointy holes at the top. So we lost one engine and almost lost the TV presenter when he, before we had FOD guards, tried to stif stick his fingers down here. That was bad. Um, and then the other one was, don't start it in the aircraft. And actually, we learned the hard way as well. And the pilot learned the hard, well, hard way is TV presenters don't know the, um, effectively how not to press buttons and things. So we end up with a pressel switch, which I basically had um, a dead man switch, which meant that only after he exited the aircraft, for the, all of our sakes, could we actually make it live. Otherwise, he was just like a kid in a toy shop. What happens if I press this? No, Andy, I've told you, don't press the button. What happens if I... Anyway, that was quite interesting. So, um, Lawrence, um, I'm just going to back away from you. Um, not that I don't trust anything. Um, and your glasses are on, aren't they? Excellent. I'm going to put my glasses on for safety because safety is really important. No one's at the front and there's nothing around you that's going to suck. He's not going to fly. It's just going to be very loud. Over to you, Lawrence. That's good, Lawrence. So as you can see, they're kind of loud. So I probably should give Lawrence ear defense, but he'll be fine. Um, I'm sure you'll all be fine as well. Please, no one to sue me. Um, but the thrust there is reasonably significant. Um, a smaller member of the audience there, if you were perhaps um, somewhere between, between um, 20 to 25 kilos, you'd actually feel that thrust pushing you up and get generating a lift force. Um, the reality is, if you, we t turn Lawrence upside down, and if anyone wants to help me hold Lawrence upside down afterwards, I can show you how fast he'll be forced into the floor. Um, so you know that, that works pretty well. Um, I'm pretty much going to run, be running out of time, but just one of the things, um, Lawrence, you, uh, let me, uh, let, you just stay there, Lawrence, would be the easiest. Um, I've just passed a couple of comments in terms of jetpacks. So I guess some of you in the audience are thinking, hey, this looks really easy. I can get a bunch of EDFs and attach them to myself and I fly. You probably can fly. Um, the big trade off is effectively the battery weight and the system weight versus the thrust. So I've played around, and if you get about 10 of these um, borrowed from um, some folks um, on the dark side, you can actually lift yourself, but only for about five feet above the ground for about 30 seconds. You probably could do some more interesting stuff as battery chemistry changes. The flip side is you can attach a bunch of jetpacks to yourself. And a, a, a friend of mine called Richard Browning is doing exactly that. Um, you, if you look, in, look up Rocket Man on um, YouTube, you'll see him flying around. 
Now, the interesting thing about Richard is he's using some really powerful engines, um, and there's a lot of thought and design going into how he's utilizing them. So again, if you think, hey, I'll just get a bunch of gas turbines and attach them onto myself, I'd seriously basically stick with the ducted fans. Nice thing about ducted fans is they don't explode when it goes wrong. Gas turbines, you suck anything in, what you call foreign object debris, into the top here, and you've basically now got a spinning hand grenade, um, and they do go off with a bomb. So not only do you destroy a very expensive engine, you simultaneously, effectively, um, probably blow your leg off as well. Um, that's it for me. Um, any questions, happy to take them, su subject to having any available time, which I'm told I do. Um, and please come and take a look at Lawrence. Uh, we won't power up while people are close um, to full speed because I don't want to damage your hearing or at the same time see any of your thing, uh, digits get sucked into the top. Thank you very much. So any questions you just ask if you uh, wait for the microphone so everyone can hear. Hi. Uh, if Lawrence lay on a skateboard and you turned the fans on, what would happen? Uh, we'd have a really exciting episode of Hacky, ha um, Hacky Races, I think. So, anyone got a skateboard? Very happy to try that. Did you measure what terminal velocity you actually managed to achieve? Oh, absolutely, yes. Always um, uh, light with the details. So, we got um, Andy Torbert up to 240, well, down to 247 miles an hour straight down. Um, and he did manage to deploy his parachute and he did walk away. Um, his comments actually were, that was so much fun, can we do it again? And I was thinking, <laughs> yes, just if I'm long as I'm not involved. How much faster do you reckon it would be if you had been able to use the gas-powered rockets rather than the fans? Uh, so I, the gas turbines were putting out 22 kgs each as opposed to 13 of these. I reckon we would have probably got them close to 280, possibly 290. Um, interestingly, actually, if, um, if you get a speed skydiver, they can typically get up to 260, 270. So I reckon we probably could, with a little bit of tuning and slightly larger engines, get them through the 300 um, mile an hour mark. The problem at that point is that uh, we're going to have to start effectively engineering his upper body to handle that sort of velocity, which would be great. I just don't want to possibly be involved. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that. H how can the, uh, uh, surely uh, at 270 miles an hour, the, the air pressure being pushed onto your head, if he's going straight down, was quite unpleasant. Like any small deviation in his neck would like put an awful lot of strain on the, on the spine. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's got a big neck. I mean, he's uh, <laughs> ex-army, so it says a lot. But um, sorry. Um, yes, it does, absolutely. But typically what happens is they tend to dive not quite at a direct um, vertical dive. You tend to go at a very slight angle. The problem, uh, the ma major challenge is actually trying to keep your orientation in free fl um, fall. Mm -hmm. So you go at a slight angle, and it's actually easier to correct that, um, particularly um, when you're compensating for counter-rotation as well. So that reduces the pressure. But absolutely, and the faster you go, effectively the greater the strain paced, um, placed effectively on the head and the spine. So if we were going to want to get him up to really fast, I mean, I'd love to get him up to basically um, break the sound barrier going 200, down. 200, 270 we'd need fast enough. <laughs> exactly. We'd need to build him a, some sort of composite harness to support his upper body. Otherwise, he'd go splat. OK, thank you. Great, and that's all the time we have. So let's give another round of applause.